It was in 1999 when Activision and Neversoft released Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, thereby redefining the entire genre of skateboarding games. With its smooth gameplay, impressive physics, intuitive controls, a variety in gameplay challenges that kept things fresh, and of course, the most famous skateboarder of all time attached to the project. While it's primitive by today's standards, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and its sequels became the tentpole of the entire skateboarding genre for over a decade. So naturally, its success spawned a bunch of imitators from similar brands hoping to get their piece of the pie. And so, with a few exceptions, the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater formula became the de facto way to make skateboarding games, right down to the buttons you press to do the tricks. So I'm looking at games that, to some degree, took obvious inspiration from the Tony Hawk's skateboarding series. So what are we looking for here? Well, the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series is defined by its over-the-top arcade physics and gameplay, a series of self-contained, very open levels, tasks to pull off, competition levels, a short timer, and so on. So these games should have some combination of those. You don't necessarily have to have a famous skateboarder attached, but that's also a bonus. The Tony Hawk's Pro Skater style is so instantly recognizable that you know it when you see it. Plus, we're looking for games that came out at least one year after the original Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. For example, I wouldn't want to accuse Thrasher Skate and Destroy of being inspired by the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series when it only came out four months after the first game. Otherwise than that, let's take a look at all the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater knockoffs through the years. Starting strong, are we? You know, I must say, it's funny to play a game based on The Simpsons that's mostly universally disliked, because there are other Simpsons games that I consider an acquired taste that seemingly everyone has but me, but I would hate to earn the ire of a fan base that passionate. But I think most who have played The Simpsons skateboarding for more than five minutes will agree that The Simpsons skateboarding is pretty bad. No joke, I bought this game back in 2013-2014 because I liked the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series, I liked The Simpsons, plus it seemed like a match made in heaven given how much of the show's iconic imagery involved Bart on a skateboard, and I thought it had promise. But not one level into it, I was regretting my purchase. To be honest, this entire game just reminds me of back when I used to skateboard because I also sucked. The fact is, this is a skateboarding game where the basic act of skateboarding is a complete and utter pain to do. Literally at your base stats, you can't even do half the tricks on flat ground. I'm sorry, but doing basic flip tricks should not be an ordeal. And hey, I understand that doing a tray flip is anything but easy. I mean, I never pulled one off. But I also have the coordination of a drunk hippo. But that's the thing, if I wanted to simulate sucking at skateboarding, I'd grab my board and go outside. Besides, that's only the beginning of the problems. The game structure as it sits goes like this. You have three different game modes you can enter into on the critical path. You have the skills school spelt with a Z, skate fest, and timed trick challenge. Skate school is your basic tutorial. Timed trick challenge is a competition style level where you have to get a certain amount of points to unlock a new character, and the majority of the game's content takes place in Skate Fest. This is the mode where you go from level to level doing various tricks to open up the next level, and there are a few repeating styles of minigames throughout Skate Fest. You'll always have the three separate point challenges, you'll always need to collect a word relevant to that level, you'll always have collectibles, but then they'll mix up some of the objectives from level to level. The actual content of the game really isn't the issue, because I feel as though if you were going to tie in the series to the act of skateboarding, this is basically as good as it gets. Recreating iconic moments from the show, and involving various members of the Springfield cast who can apparently teleport now. Barney, are you aware that there's multiple of you? I would even say that the levels themselves are actually pretty good as skateboarding levels go. They adapt the world of Springfield quite well, with plenty of places for crazy tricks integrated into the design. They even have some fun little background easter eggs like billboards and such. But here's the thing, you need multiple things to have a game like this work. Level design is one of the building blocks, but controlling well is possibly the most important out of all the building blocks. Something like this does not control well at all. It may look like I'm playing terribly, but you have no idea how ungodly bad the controls are unless you play the game for yourself. Everything feels so heavy with the game, first of all, and not in the I have clinical depression and have gone off my meds for medical reasons way, but in the I have to force every single move I do sort of way. Pulling off tricks with any sort of precision is an accomplishment, the collectible collision is shaky at best, whether we're talking about the range on collecting letters or things like these signs not responding to you when you hit them, everything feels slightly unresponsive. 
You can't go up an incline of any reasonable degree, even turning around is an ordeal to the point where half the time I would just slam into a wall just to make it easier. And the controls can be so imprecise that when you line yourself up with something, you have no idea if you're actually going to pull off what you're intending to pull off. Plus, the level design at times is built for a game with much smoother controls than the game actually has. So I found that to access certain areas, I had to basically cheese the system. And to be fair, if you're not happy with your base stats, you get money that you can upgrade yourself with, but once again, being able to do the basic level of stuff should be the default by which you build off of. I shouldn't have to upgrade myself just to be able to do the basic stuff in the game. I quickly realized I wasn't going to bother with the collectibles quest because even the easiest collectibles were positioned in the most inconvenient locations, like this one rail sequence where you have to do a massive run up to get the necessary speed because once again the game engine is so heavy that going up an incline rail to any reasonable degree is nigh impossible. But in this game it's also entirely possible to accidentally trip on curbs and take a guess of what's right in front of that rail. You have to get enough speed to clear the curb, get up the rail, and balance for long enough to get the collectible. And that's only one of nine collectibles you have to get per level. No thanks. You also can't rotate on your own. The game does that by itself automatically. A small thing, but it's a staple of adding points to a combo. Just goes to make this game feel automated where it shouldn't feel automated, because that's the thing with arcade skateboarding, is you're gonna have to automate things to a certain extent because things are happening really fast, so you don't have the luxury of being able to methodically plan out every single movement like in the skate games. In some ways, this game feels automated where it should be organic, and it's organic where it should be automated, such as how you have to hold forward to gain speed. That should be automatic because you never don't need speed. And if you have to constantly be holding forward, that means you can't make sharp turns because forward as well as left and right are on the same axis. You have to constantly be exchanging one for the other if you see what I mean. Just everything feels slightly off with this. The tricks feel slightly off, the collision feels slightly off, the ability to maneuver feels slightly off, and what does it all amount to? Bail after bail after bail. The way this game is skewed makes it extremely easy to bail in a way that's not present in pretty much any other skateboarding game. The Simpsons Skateboarding is a game that requires a level of precision that the game itself refuses to have, and yet I played through most of it. I guess it's the fact that every level only had a handful of main tasks, and the length of each level basically relies on the intuitiveness of the level design. Hence why I spent quite a lot of time in Burns' Mansion, because for as intricate as that level is, it's a maze to work out. But genuinely, I was able to complete some of these levels in like 15 minutes. The main overarching tasks were usually pretty easy to figure out, and had relatively forgiving time limits, then surprisingly the trick-based challenges are actually kind of easy as well. The amount of points you get for various tricks seemingly don't deteriorate, which is good because some of these tricks are completely and utterly stupid to pull off when it comes to their specific inputs. I'm sorry, is this a skateboarding game or is it a fighting game? Why do I have to do two full rotations to get a single trick? Are you aware that most of the time we only spend around one to two seconds actually in the air? Once you go past pressing a direction twice to do a specific trick, you're on thin ice. How can you expect a person to have enough time to do two full rotations just to do a single trick? But with that said, I guess some of these trick challenges were easy because I remembered the cardinal rule of subpar arcade skateboarding games, and that is spam, spam, spam. In this case, every time you grind, your positioning is automatically reset back to the middle, which means that if you find a relative straightaway or a full circuit of grind that has enough straightaways that you can keep resetting, you can pretty much easily spam the grinds, which is how I got most of the way through the game. I did actually get decently far into the game before I quit, and when I decided to quit, it wasn't my own fault. It's just that towards the end of the game, the game starts having you do these things called in-the-zone tricks. Now, in-the-zone tricks are essentially this game's version of specials, but however you're supposed to do the in-the-zone tricks is not self-explanatory, and I even decided to go back to these little tutorial levels to try and figure out if one of them teaches you what an in-the-zone trick is. But then my game crashed, and I lost my save, and that's when I decided I was done. I would have definitely beaten the game, but the universe stepped in and told me not to. It's a shame that this game is as bad as it is, because to be honest, a Simpsons skateboarding game would be a good idea, but it wasn't meant to be, and I would like to see it revisited at some point, but The Simpsons hasn't had a non-mobile game since more than half the show's runtime ago. Sadly, I don't think this game was a bad idea, and it's not far away from being a halfway decent skateboarding game. Just tighten up the controls, make the physics lighter, make the collision more forgiving, and that's basically it. 
It's not the worst skateboarding game I've ever played, and it has some redeeming qualities, but it can be a chore to play at times. I give it a 3 out of 10. So who is Andy McDonald? F***ed if I know. Before this video, I'd never even heard of him, but come to find out he's literally the most accomplished skateboarder in the history of the X Games as of, like, 2004. Making him technically the greatest skateboarder in history. Now, this game came out in late 2000, during the dying days of the PlayStation 1. However, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 came out roughly a year earlier, so it's a bit tough to know if this game was made based on the success of THPS, or if it was just a coincidence that THQ wanted to cash in on the popularity of skateboarding at the same time as Activision and missed the boat on Tony Hawk. Either way, whatever you want to call this game, controls basically identically to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, and came out a long enough time after that I can consider this a knockoff. I mean, it certainly feels like a game that was made in a year. There was a period of time where I was very much prepared to absolutely crap all over this game, but I feel inclined to be more charitable despite myself. If you go into this game with the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater mindset, you're gonna be disappointed because Andy McDonald's skateboarding or whatever does not give instant gratification. It's actually a very methodical game that takes quite a bit of time to get your head around, but still that doesn't excuse its issues, such as the horrendous frame rate, though that was probably my fault for choosing the PS1 version. I should really stop doing that when better options exist because I can almost feel this game trying to punch above its weight. But with that said, it's entirely possible to make a well-designed skateboarding game that feels good to play on the PS1. And there are plenty of flaws that you can't blame on the hardware, such as the flip trick timing. If you ever see me going off a ramp and not doing anything in the footage, there's a guarantee that I was attempting to do a flip trick but didn't get the timing right. The window you have to pull one off is so narrow and I never quite actually figured out what the timing was even as I beat the game. But even still, you can't flip trick and grab in the same combo, or if you can, the timing is so arcane that I never figured out how to do it. So if your choice is between a flip trick and a grab, you're gonna have to choose grabs anyway, because those give you way more points. Plus, another flaw is you bail really easily, to the point that half the time I'm not even sure what it was that made me bail. Can you tell me? Though I do love the sudden transition when you bail sometimes, it's literally so sudden that it reminds me of that one Grimace Shake meme that went around a while ago. I'm not sure if the point amount at the end of a run is entirely based on your total score, but the end of the run always has these pointers for you, so there's a possibility that the game might deduct points for bailing or for lack of variety and so on. But either way, if you do bail, it's probably worth it just to restart your run, because quite frankly, getting things going a second time takes so much time and effort that it's best not to bother and keep going until you get a perfect or semi-perfect run. That is unless you're doing one of the missions where you have to collect a certain amount of pictures as well as get points, which is the only time in the campaign where they change things up, and those can be a bit obnoxious. Early on, it's forgiving. You only need to get four pictures and then score some points, but by the time you have to collect eight pictures, you're really gonna have to budget your time. The secret to enjoying this game is to not give up on it, because I was basically telling myself that I was gonna quit after the third level because I was so frustrated. I was swearing, nothing was working, but something kept me going and I can't quite tell you what. Then something clicked with me and I was suddenly able to wrap my head around the game. I figured out what the game requires of you to land tricks without bailing. I realized you had to build up your momentum before you start pulling off crazy tricks. Then also you have to let go of your grabs well before you hit the ground, because if you're still in the animation of doing the trick while you're coming into contact with the ramp, then you're gonna bail. It's not like Tony Hawk, where so long as you're rotationally aligned correctly or land on something flat, you'll usually still land the trick even if you're still in the animation. So this game is not forgiving, however with these things in mind, I found I was able to start building up momentum and then suddenly I was getting massive points and genuinely long sequences of tricks unbroken by bailing. I found myself steamrolling through every level on the first try, and they don't require you to get a super massive amount of points. Even by the end of the game, it doesn't escalate to the point of needing to get like a 9.0 average. It's fairly reasonable as far as how good you need to be to get through the game. There is one point, however, where I almost quit the game. There's this one level where you have to skate in a dilapidated train station, and most of the level has this low roof. 
low enough that your maximum height in a decent half pipe will have you collide with the roof. And most other areas where the roof is far enough away have issues where they don't have good half pipes and you'll likely bail anyway meaning it's nearly impossible to get a good trick sequence going. I was ready to pack it in, but I decided to give it one more shot to find a decent spot, and I found one in the back corner of the level and managed to get through that one. And instances like that are why, despite eventually having fun with the game, I can't in good conscience call it a good game. Because the engine is obviously janky enough that it gets in the way of the game quite a bit. When this game works, it's slower paced and a more methodical alternative to the Tony Hawk series that is genuinely enjoyable to me. But the problem is, getting to that point is obnoxious. The game still makes it a fight. But with that said, I still ended up beating the game and even checked out some of the side content like that really annoying big air mode, which by all rights I should not have trouble with if I'm playing as Danny Way, the guy who basically invented this style of skateboarding. Also, I checked out that one level in Hell. They called it Hades, but it's Hell. Skating through the level, I'm half expecting to see Dante and Virgil entering the third circle. No, I'm not referencing Devil May Cry, I'm referencing Dante's Inferno. Get some culture in you, why don't you? Though I don't think Dante's Inferno had furries. Though I could be wrong. Yeah, why is a guy in a teddy bear costume the best skater in the game? They certainly had fun with their extra characters, so I ultimately enjoyed this game, but I'm not sure if I would consider it a good game. It's very flawed, the frame rate is bad, the engine can be quite janky and inconsistent, but I guess I'm just a sucker for these types of games, so eventually I got good. But not everybody should be as forgiving as me. I give it a 5 out of 10. Subjectively fun, but objectively flawed. Ah oh man, Backyard Skateboarding. This was one I was not looking forward to. Not because it doesn't look good, but because it's a slightly retro PC game, and I've had bad experiences with these. I feel like I'm traumatized from when I tried to get Interstate 76 working properly, so pray for me. Oh, it works raw. Well, I couldn't quite get it to work on Windows 11, but Windows 10 had it working just fine. Perhaps even working as intended. What wizards did they have working at Humongous Entertainment? Yep, this is a game by Humongous, famous for the likes of Freddy Fish, Putt-Putt, and Pajama Sam. These guys were a very big part of my childhood. Pajama Sam was my jam. Say that five times drunk. And this is a game that's part of their ongoing sports game catalog, and even has a set of recurring characters, including the nerd boy, the hippie girl, and a couple of racial stereotypes. Also Andy McDonald, who's also appearing in this game. One time, when I was little, I accidentally drank a bottle of Bug Killer, and it was poison. But luckily my mom is like a nurse, and nurses like save people, and she saved my life because it was poison, and poison is bad for you, so don't drink it already! You know, I feel kind of bad for him in all honesty, because despite on an objective level having a better resume than Tony Hawk, as far as the media is concerned, he kind of comes across as the poor man's Tony Hawk. Well anyways, this is Humongous' attempt at a Tony Hawk-style game for super young kids. It follows the same progression as Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4, with open levels and tasks you can activate at your leisure, and I will admit, this is the easiest game on the list by a wide margin. Even the hardest tasks in this game only took me one or two tries. And sometimes the only reason they took more than one try was because the controls weren't cooperating. For example, having to do a mic twist was surprisingly an ordeal because you're supposed to click the grab button twice and yet I would do that and it would just do the single button prompt grab twice instead. Then there's also the times when I would just assume that I know what to do and skipped the dialogue and completely missed what I had to do. Because sometimes they don't have obvious on-screen objective instructions. Which I will cop to, but as long as I knew what to do, it was all completely self-explanatory. But everything else, I mean any task where I had to get points was piss easy. But there's a reason for that. It's probably a bit of a design oversight, but if you rapidly press the left and right mouse buttons on something that you can grind on, you'll constantly ollie out and then snap back into the rail, and each trick will count as part of an ongoing combo. Which means some of the point gathering games I could finish literally in less than 5 seconds. And just doing this casually, there were times when I could get over 3 million points. And the funny thing is, whenever you do an impressive trick, the announcer will shout out what you did in excitement. And as it turns out, I don't think they ever expected anyone to get over 2 million points in one go, because I got a 3 million point combo at one point, and they said this. Two million point combo! 100 trick combo! 
so yeah, that's easy. And a lot of these tasks have you just doing a simple trick or collecting a series of items scattered around the level, and maneuvering around the level is easy. Even the balance was easy because the balance minigame never gets noticeably harder. I'm okay with this because quite frankly, this is, as far as the engine is concerned, as close as it gets to being a Tony Hawk game without being Tony Hawk. As a matter of fact, you could have told me they used the exact same engine for this, and I'd have believed you because it has the same accuracy and tightness of controls that you would expect. Plus, the level design is quite decent, with plenty of interesting spots and skateboarding architecture, and the level themes are also very interesting, with such things as a medieval castle and even a space-based skate park. Unfortunately, there's only a small handful of levels which might have disappointed me if I were a paying customer, but every level is extensive and creative. So there's certainly enough content to keep you busy. Although the soundtrack is a bit annoying, especially that one song they choose to end the game with. It feels like sort of a modern ironic deconstruction of the rock and roll genre, but that doesn't make it sound any better. Other than that, the only thing that's missing for me is controller support. Because keyboard controls that I'm not used to can be a bit… confusing. And I would love to play this with the same controls as the Tony Hawk games. If we were able to have that, this could easily be an alternative that reaches or even surpasses the thing it's inspired by. I feel like the fact that it's so easy means that it can only be so good to a grown-ass adult like me, but this is perfect for young kids, and it's a shame that this is abandonware at this point. It never got the same revivals that Pajama Sam, Putt-Putt, or Freddy Fish got. But honestly, I could see myself going back to this one. It's a solid-as-hell game and a great addition to the genre of Tony Hawk-inspired games. I give it a 7 out of 10. <laughs> Oh my god, Skateboard Madness Extreme Edition. On the surface, this doesn't look like a game that you would look twice at, but there's one thing about this game cover that almost guarantees a bad time. And that is that little logo right there, Phoenix Games. This is a publisher that was notorious for making or publishing some of the worst games ever made. Snow White and the Seven Clever Boys? That was them. So right from the beginning, I'm not looking forward to this, and one of the major red flags is the fact that it was only 150 megabytes during an era where most games were at least, at least, 3 gigabytes. And holy hell, it does not disappoint on that front. Or it does disapp- you know what I mean. Everything about this from the moment you start it up looks amateur hour, from the insultingly basic, inconsistent menu elements to the lack of sound, everything. And hey, who do you want to skate as? Guy 1? Guy 2? Guy 3? Oh wait, they're all the same guy. Pretty much. It's the same basic model with different skin tones and hairstyles. Even then, they can only get a small handful of them. I've already lost faith in this game and we haven't even started it yet. But once we do start, oh my god. This might just be one of the worst games I've ever played. And that's not one bit of an exaggeration. It feels like an alpha demo of a bootleg. God, I, I don't even know where to start. The controls are some of the worst I've ever felt. It feels like you're swimming through molasses for how sluggish and unresponsive they feel. In a lot of cases, you have to perfectly line everything up, and based on how slow and finicky the controls can be, it feels like you have to force every little thing. Even then, sometimes even the most basic of actions fail to happen. Plus, this game only registers button inputs when it feels like it. Sometimes you'll ramp off and do a kickflip, and sometimes the mystery timing will be off, and nothing will happen. This specific timing could not be more awkward, and given how hard it is to line these things up, that's a real pain in the ass. Worse yet, the physics are janky as hell. You'll often find yourself power sliding uncontrollably or moving counter to the inputs you're pressing. What's even worse is it's so incredibly easy to bail. Literally, if you land slightly off-center, you go down. And if you transition from a flat surface to a curved surface, you fall down. If you hit an ankle-high ledge going faster than a sloth, you'll fall down. And if you breathe too loudly, you'll fall down. And if you do bail, they lock your controls for an agonizing few seconds for no reason. Move! Between the controls and constant bailing, it feels like everything about this game is a fight. And that's only made worse by the fact that this game will oftentimes, no joke, auto-rotate. If you see me spinning in the air, there's a 50-50 chance that I'm not doing anything. Rotating by yourself is sluggish enough, but if you approach from a slight angle, I think, the game will just spin by itself, which only increases the failure rate of doing tricks. Everything in this game leads in the direction of uncontrollable bailing, and it's so ungodly frustrating. 
Like, I cannot possibly do justice to just how awful this game feels to play. It's like they were going out of their way to make it feel as awkward as possible. Based just on the footage, you can probably tell that it looks and feels so artificial that it's not even funny. Part of the requirements of a skateboarding game is to have physics that feel tangible. Not necessarily realistic, but at least tangible. As in, it operates on some level of consistent physics. The physics in this game are basically non-existent. It's the least satisfying engine I've ever felt in a skateboarding game. And the camera? Oh my god, the camera. It'll just flip, clip into things, and completely go nuts at the drop of a dime. Plus, there's a million little amateur mistakes. Like being unable to exit a half pipe unless you do this weird spinning move, which will probably make you bail. Grinding doesn't get harder the longer you do it, so you can just grind forever and nothing will change. Depending on which level you play, there's a chance you might spawn in the twilight zone. If you're holding the X button to ollie preemptively, but then catch even the slightest bit of air, the ollie will be cancelled out. And then there's the difficulty, which can be measured with the same accuracy as a blunderbuss. The game mode where you have to get a certain amount of points is piss easy, even with all the bailing, because the point amount is incredibly low and there's no point degradation to repeated tricks. You can do the same tricks over and over and get the exact same amount of points, which makes sense seeing as there's only something like 7 tricks you can do in the entire game, 2 different types of flip trick, 1 type of grind, and a small handful of grabs. So there's no variety on top of everything. Oh, and for what it's worth, if you see me cycling through tricks, that's not me. The game does that by itself, and I have no idea how or why. This game has a mind of its own. The funny thing is, too, the game will at times not register the tricks that you are doing, and at other times will actually register tricks that you didn't do. But even with the incredibly fiddly trick landing, you'll still easily get the points total in 2 or 3 minutes. But they give you 10 minutes per run. Talk about overkill. But they also don't give you a way to end the run once you have enough points, so you have to wait, or in my case, just turn the emulation speed up. Dance, 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 dance. So despite all the issues, you'll be hard pressed to fail at this. Meanwhile, the other two game modes, Collection and Race, run the gamut of piss easy to nearly impossible. In the first level, you're given 2 minutes and 20 seconds to collect all these skateboards, but the controls being what they are, accurately lining yourself up to get the skateboards, is impossible. Timing an ollie to get up the stairs is impossible, getting out of this half pipe after you've collected all the skateboards inside is impossible, and if you bail, you lose like 5 seconds. This legitimately took me like 20 minutes to do. Then the race in the second level was a pain in the ass. Even though they gave you 6 minutes to do it, they put a whole bunch of checkpoints on top of these giant stairs cases. And let me tell you something, these giant staircases are impossible, and I literally mean impossible to ollie up. And the slightest impact will have you bail. Plus, the ramps you can use to access these areas are few and far between. So to do this in time, you have to do this weird side hop where you gradually get up the stairs. It's difficult and doesn't even work half the time, but at least it exists, and I managed to win the race by the skin of my teeth. You have to do all three of these separate challenges in a level to unlock the next level, and I honestly got to level 3 and stopped because between the inconsistent difficulty and the absolute torture that is the gameplay, it took me an hour to get that far. And the funny thing is, there's only 5 levels. That's right, 5 levels. Each with one single annoying as hell 20 second music loop each. So if you're good, you could probably beat this game in less than an hour, but that would also require dealing with the absolute torture that is Skateboard Madness Extreme Edition as a whole. And look at these. Is this not the most boringly laid out series of skateboarding levels you've ever seen? It's so flat and lifeless, with spots coming few and far between. And when they are, they're incredibly basic spots. Then the graphics are bland and low quality, there's no style, and they only bothered to make five of the things. Is it just me, or does everything about this game scream low quality bootleg? Even the name of this game screams low quality bootleg. Words genuinely fail me in my attempts to articulate the spectacular awfulness that is Skateboard Madness Extreme Edition. It is without a doubt an F-tier game, and the F-tier for me is reserved for things that are barely games. Skateboard Madness Extreme Edition fails in every way. It's ugly, it's amateurish, the gameplay is fundamentally awful on every level, it's lazy, it's cynical, it's executed so poorly it deserves to be executed. I could spend 20 minutes just saying different turns of phrase about how this game deserves to be thrown in the fieriest pits of the hottest volcano in the world. Fuck this game. Zero out of ten.
You know what's funny? During my play session where I was playing Skateboard Madness Extreme Edition, I played Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure immediately after, and I gotta say, I don't think I've ever had a more drastic palate cleanser. We are basically going from the outhouse to the penthouse. Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure is one that I've been aware of for quite a while, like since I was 14. I had a friend from high school who was one of those people who managed to keep their childlike whimsy into adulthood. Personally, I'm jealous. He was a big fan of skateboarding and a big fan of Disney, so he was the one who made me aware of this game that is essentially Tony Hawk, but with Disney characters. And he was not lying whatsoever. I knew the lead developers were Toys for Bob. See platformer fans, they existed before they made the things you like, and they will exist long after. But I was surprised to see that Neversoft was credited as well. Come to find out that it's because Toys for Bob was lent the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4 engine to make this game basically making this less of a knockoff, but more of a reskin. But I'm still including it because when the hell else am I going to be able to cover this game? I was taken aback at first because the opening cinematic includes a bunch of random clips of kids skateboarding. Definitely selling this as Tony Hawk, but for kids, slightly older than the ones backyard skateboarding was aimed at. And they have an entire story mode for the kid characters. Hey look, it's my friend Ryan. I didn't know he was in this game. But in all honesty, I barely indulged in the gameplay with regular humans, mostly because you have to create a custom character and something about customizing a child's appearance felt wrong to me, so I immediately clicked off. Besides, we're here for the Disney characters. And of course, I decided to put in the cheat to unlock all the characters so I could play through the story mode as Zerg, but you do have a healthy selection of characters you can choose from. Wait, what, what the hell is that? Sweet salty Jesus on a bun, is that child Jane? De-aging is one thing, but that looks like a creepypasta. To be fair, most of the human characters in this game look goofy, and not in the usual way. Like, look at Clayton. That man is 80% teeth. As far as progression, this game is basically identical to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4. You're thrown into an open-ended level, and throughout the level, you have a whole bunch of different tasks you need to pull off, but tasks that you need to activate yourself. And to be honest, this game didn't start on the correct foot, considering that the very first task I had to do was getting Ham down from the toilet, and there was no indication that I had to press the flush button at the top of the toilet to do that. He even says as much. I bet you're wondering what I was doing there in the first place. Not to mention why flushing was the way to save me. But it gets better after that. You're given four sets of levels depending on who you play as. You got a set of levels based on Toy Story, a set of levels based on The Lion King, a set of levels based on Tarzan, and a set of levels for the humans. You know, if you wanted to play as them for some reason. As far as movie accuracy, I think these all look relatively accurate to the environments they're basing themselves on, and there's a certain novelty to skating around familiar locales. You can definitely tell that this was an attempt to be Baby's first Tony Hawk game, as every set of three levels for each of the movie worlds have the same difficulty progression that's relative to each other. So instead of having 12 levels with tasks that gradually ramp up in difficulty, you have four sets of levels that each ramp up in difficulty only relative to those sets of levels, if you see what I mean. So the big point scoring challenge in every third level is 150,000 for example. I can do that in my sleep, and even by those standards, I think some of these challenges are piss easy, like grinding around this pond. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. But that's not a flaw, that's just the game knowing its audience, much like backyard skateboarding. What is a flaw is that sometimes the harder tasks aren't hard because of anything inherent in the game, but rather because of some stupid obtuse design. Like how you have to hand plant on four elephant skulls, but the game doesn't tell you where the elephant skulls are. Plus, for one of these, you have to first find the skull in a random cavern and knock it down. Even now, I have no idea how I did that. To be honest, I thought the elephant skull in this case was just part of the set dressing. So all of this was just obtusity on top of obtusity. What an idiot I am for my inability to predict that. And sometimes you have that classic Tony Hawk issue where the game doesn't register that you're doing the thing it asked you to do. Like how I'm supposed to grind this arch, which was pretty hard to get to I might add, but then the game doesn't register that I did what it asked me to do. I have no idea what the differentiating factor was here. So yeah, the design can be a bit inconsistent at times, but that's just Tony Hawk games in a nutshell. There's also an issue where the game forces you to play as certain characters to do certain tasks. I have no idea why that needed to be the case. And there's a further issue where playing as non-human characters can make landing tricks a little bit hard to do. Because when you have a human character and a skateboard, it's very easy to know when you're aligned with things properly. But when you have non-human characters with funky board designs, or non-human characters that stand on the board crooked or whatever, it can be hard to visually line them up with split-second timing. 
which is a flaw definitely inherent in this concept of adding non-human characters to a skateboarding game, so I'm not sure how you would fix that. I also really don't dig the game's soundtrack. It's a who's who of Disney-approved early 2000s butt rock. The only ones I recognized were Smash Mouth and Simple Plan. Simple Plan, which I rank as the fourth worst Canadian export, losing out to Johnny Test, Caillou, and French people. Still, I can't stress enough that if you like the Tony Hawk games, you'll like this, because it's basically the same thing. It has all the same creative level design, the same simple controls, the versatility to allow you to string massive lines together, and a variety of interesting levels. It's not quite as good as the best Tony Hawk games because it has a few polish issues and some flaws that are inherent to its design, but as far as games that attempt to ape off the style of Tony Hawk, this is easily the best one. But then again, it was cheating slightly given the fact that it was using the same engine. Either way, I give it an 8 out of 10. You know, while I was doing research into this small subgenre of games, I came across a little game called Go Go Hypergrind. After looking up a bit of footage of it, the way it came across to me was, and I mean this 100% genuinely, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater for furries. So if you're one of those people, this is for you. And here's the thing, I knew I was expecting something weird when it came to this game, I could tell just by the name, but I was not prepared for the depths of WTF this game goes to. It's possibly the most Japanese game I've ever played, though I'm not super well versed personally. But what blows my mind is this was a collaboration between Atlas, the Persona people, and Spumco, the studio responsible for such things as Ren and Stimpy and The Ripping Friends, the latter of which was one of my favorite shows growing up, which should tell you everything you need to know. Now, even though development was handled by a company called Papanchi, Spumco and Atlas collaborating to make a skateboarding game. It can't be overstated how much it feels like the universe hit the random button. So you have the most outlandish American animation studio of the time combined with Japan. So every time you think they've reached critical mass with weirdness, they pile a few more layers on. So the plot is, there's this thing called the Toon World, where animation studios send their storyboards so that cartoon characters can act them out. It's a weird sort of Roger Rabbit setup, but computer-generated animation is strangling the Toon economy, so you need to create one massive super blowout event of a movie to try and win favor back with the general audience. And holy crap, does this hit close to home with all the AI stuff going on right now. So basically, you need to pick from one of various different cartoons and fight through several elimination skateboarding tournaments until only one remains, thereby they will be the star of the movie. I thought as though I was going to give snarky names to all these characters, but I feel as though it's almost more instructive just to describe them. You have a pig in a bikini, a toilet paper mummy with pink hair, an actual leather-clad cat, and of course who they are probably intending as the main character, Crash Bandicoot, if he was a wolf. And on top of that, you also have a giant buff cat as a rival. It's certainly a creative roster, if nothing else. But it's not doing anything to dissuade the idea that this is Tony Hawk's pro skater for furries. The bulk of the gameplay is thus. You're going level by level, having to do various singular minigames based in that level. You're competing with other characters, and whoever has the least amount of points by the end of the level gets kicked out. Your points also carry over from level to level, so it's entirely possible to get a lead so massive that it's literally impossible to catch up. You have modes where you have to get the most amount of points in a certain amount of time, or get the most points in a single trick, but the rest of the modes require an explanation of something called gimmicks. They're essentially cartoon-style traps that inflict grievous bodily harm in a cartoon way. And every level has quite a number of clever traps, and you even have the ability to stack certain traps, like if you light your board on fire, you can light fuses on dynamite and whatnot. The gimmicks is actually a very clever gimmick to build the game around. Looking at it, I think this game is to Tony Hawk what cell damage was to Twisted Metal, right down to the art style. Aside from the two game modes I mentioned, there's the battle mode where you have to put yourself into gimmicks in order to get a weapon to use on your opponent, Simon Says where you have to try and get as many gimmicks that the game wants you to get within a certain time span, a race where you have to put yourself into gimmicks until you have three medals at which point you have to go back to the main gate, and then finally something simply called minigame which will vary from level to level. So this is an interesting setup with a lot of potential for fun ideas, and honestly, they do deliver. The gameplay is possibly the most flawless recreation of Tony Hawk's pro skater style gameplay without directly copying it that I've played. 
The gameplay is a bit slower than I would have liked, but with that, you always feel completely in control, and there's a good snappiness to the gameplay where the effective range on a lot of various things, from rails to gimmicks, are relatively forgiving, so you don't have to worry about being overly precise, nailing that arcadey feeling that these games need. Granted, there are a few weird creative decisions, such as with the GameCube having fewer buttons than other consoles of the time, it had to be a compromise to include the gimmick function, so this game has no flip tricks. Yeah, no shit. This is a skateboarding game where you seemingly can't do a kickflip. Fiddle dee dee. Another weird decision is having it to where you have to press the X button to properly interact with the gimmicks, which is a bit fiddly. So a split second button press can be the difference between getting a points multiplier or bailing and losing your entire combo. It's a pointless barrier, but that only caught me a handful of times, so I won't get too indignant. Because I love how these gimmicks are weaved into gameplay. In the point challenge, for example, they're a combo amplifier that keeps your point score going between tricks for a short amount of time, or in the battle mode, gimmicks give you weapons. It's a well-integrated concept that gives this game its unique identity and is weaved into every aspect of the gameplay intelligently. Granted, some of the individual modes can be a bit hit and miss. The worst of it would be the aforementioned race mode, because whatever you get for each gimmick is completely and utterly random. Plus, the power downs are really unbalanced, meaning that if you get a string of them in a row, you're basically helpless. So between the randomness and the lack of balance, winning these is almost entirely down to luck. Plus, this is one of those modes where you have to do a mini tournament, so you never have to play it just once. But it's still not a killer aspect, and most of these game modes are fun for what they are. The gameplay engine is stimulating and precise, so what's not to love? I think the main problem, for me anyway, is that every single game goes on for far too long. Every level takes about half an hour before you get through every minigame in that level. And some of them even have multiple tournaments within the tournament where you have to do a bunch of battles or races or whatever, all for the purpose of getting 12 points apiece. The problem with arcadey gameplay like this is that they benefit from short run times. And if you push that, you're on thin ice. This game pushes it to such a ridiculous degree that it's not even funny. In every single tournament level, only one person gets eliminated, and so you have to go through eight levels, each at roughly a half hour of length, with each level having only one song that plays over and over and over and drills into your skull. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's too much. I packed it in after two hours, shortly after getting to level four. Yes, four of eight. At that point, I was over the whole ordeal and wanted it to be over, and no amount of charmingly awkward in-between level cutscenes will change that. And theoretically, you have to do this with every single character to unlock every single ending. <laughs> no. But the sad thing is, I do think this game is genuinely good. The core gameplay is responsive, if a little bit slow, and the entire concept is really unique. So I would say this game is definitely one of the standouts. It's fun to play, but not fun to beat. But it basically does everything right, so aside from the padding, I can't get too hung up on it. I give it a 7 out of 10. Oh, you thought I was done with Disney skateboarding games? <laughs> well, think again. We're not done, and we won't be done after this. Not only that, but this is also one of three different attempts from Konami to make a skateboarding game. So this one is using their engine, which as I will discuss when we get a little bit deeper into the list, is not a very good skateboarding engine. Still, let's not count this one out. It's essentially a skateboarding game from that era where Disney was desperately trying to reintroduce their classic characters to a new audience, and what's more rad than skateboarding? Anyways, I'm gonna pick Pete because I'm a raging hipster. Now, there's one thing that kind of struck me about this game right off the bat. Well, a few things, most notably in the first level. I mean, does this strike as a bit familiar to anybody? You're on a skateboard, skating down what looks like some sort of San Francisco-esque level. You have these weird green shiny stones you have to collect. Looks a little bit emerald-esque, if you ask me. There's these giant rings you have to go through to finish the level, and you have, like pads on the ground that boost your speed. You get graded at the end of the level depending on your point score and performance. Am I bringing across what this reminds me of? Well, let me spell it out. This seriously reminds me of SA2. 
A game I haven't played in quite a while, but it has unmistakable iconography. Iconography that this game is seemingly ripping off and making a core element of gameplay, and once I got that into my head I couldn't stop thinking about it. Even the intro kinda reminds me of that as well, but that might be because the intro is aggressively early 2000s. I mean, am I crazy for thinking levels like this are evoked by levels like this? This is like a combination of a Tony Hawk Pro Skater game, particularly one of the downhill levels from the first game, and a bad Sonic game. So, most Sonic games. Because on one hand, you have to go through these levels and pull off a bunch of tasks that will determine your score at the end of the level, and if you don't get a high enough score, you can't move on. But unlike Tony Hawk games, where you can retry a level as many times as you need to pull off specific tasks, you have to do this all in one go in order to have a decent score by the end. I didn't know that at first, which was a real lurch when I saw that my tasks had been reset when I retried. But either way, that's the Tony Hawk contribution to this game, aside from having very similar controls and gameplay. And what it takes from Sonic, aside from some of the visuals, is that you have to go through a specifically designated course and get to the end of the level. In this case, the course is determined by these checkpoints, and if you can't make it to the end of the level in time, all that effort was for naught. But also, the reason I specify a bad Sonic game is because the physics are actually very slow and methodical, and it's only once you hit a boost pad that you'll actually speed up to any significant degree. The physics and momentum are just bad, and the controls aren't exactly great either. You'll snap to rails well enough, but the timing on the tricks are a bit hit and miss. Which makes building a combo a bit difficult, so the gameplay is slightly obnoxious and requires probably a little bit too much out of you for 5 minutes by default, but you don't have to do everything, just enough to get enough points in order to move on to the next level. However, there is one aspect to this game that is such a killer aspect that it makes me genuinely despise this game. The announcer. Eyes open, the tail slide, and another. Heel flip. Sheer game. Throws in. 720 kick flip. Now we have a hard flip. The 50 grind. 7 trick combo. Superb board control. Christ almighty, he does not shut the f*** up. Having to deal with this for a couple of hours of playtime made me want to reach into the game and pull each and every one of the announcer's toenails off one by one until he learns to know when to shut the hell up. You can apparently turn this off, but it's so bad it shouldn't have been there in the first place. I don't know, this was one of those games I couldn't actually bother to finish because it had a million little annoyances. The controls were a bit stiff, the level design was a bit obnoxious, the tasks were a bit unreasonable, and the overall physics and momentum system just didn't feel good to play. Skateboarding games don't have that many moving pieces, so every moving piece needs to work, and each flaw is felt much more than a more complex game's individual mechanics would be felt. And nothing about this game feels good. It all feels slightly off, and when you top that all off with something this annoying... To kickflip, to and another Quite frankly, it chipped away at any desire I had to play this game full stop. I give it a 3 out of 10. Disney's extremely goofy skateboarding is technically the first chronologically, but in my case, it's the third Disney-based skateboarding game, this time starring Goofy alone. Well, actually, you can play as Max, Goofy's son, who I chose to play as because Goofy is basically the last Disney character I want to play as, with maybe the exception of Donald Duck, hence why I haven't played much Kingdom Hearts. Now, this is another early 2000s PC game, which surprisingly still works on Windows 10. Much like backyard skateboarding, it seemingly didn't work on Windows 11, which is fine, that's why I keep my slightly old laptop around. Though I'm not sure if this game is only meant to run at like 25 FPS, or if this is a hardware compatibility issue, but this frame rate is pretty rough. And it makes the gameplay feel a bit slow and unresponsive. Like, trying to get up this little ledge was like pulling teeth, because I had to learn how to turn enough to get up without colliding into the wall or falling off down the ledge. And the specific timing to get that precision is not self-explanatory whatsoever, although I will acquiesce if this is just on my end. Either way, you have two main modes. One mode where you have to collect a bunch of things with no time limit, and a mode where you have to do a certain amount of tricks and whatnot on a time limit. The non-time limit based levels are really boring because there's no urgency whatsoever, and it's essentially just a collect-a-thon of the worst kind, where there's nothing stopping you and you just need to go around the level and find stuff. I mean, the coins are the most asinine part for me because there are so many coins that you can reach the goal amount with like a hundred coins left in the level, but in fairness, this game was definitely made for kids. Though of all the games on this list made for kids, this one's probably the worst. 
First of all, I'll say I really don't enjoy using the keyboard and mouse for this type of game, but normally that wouldn't get in the way. It's something that I could adapt to, but in this case, it's the engine that makes the controls a little shaky, so there's no control setup that would have worked perfectly. You'd still be doing the same awkward ollies, the same kickflips with the confusing timing, the same awkward grabs, and so on. The frame rate and the general slowness of gameplay makes the gameplay really obnoxious, which is funny because even in the levels where you do have a time limit, it's extremely easy. You only need to do two of three tasks to move on to the next level, and even the most basic tricks gives you a surprising amount of points, so if you can pull off a half-assed combo, you'll pretty much get to the point score immediately. Then you need to find specific spots to do tricks on, which varies in difficulty from level to level, but then there's also the task for pulling off a specific amount of multi-trick combos, and you want to know what my solution to that was? Press the button to do a manual or nose manual, then press the ollie button twice to do a pop shove it. That counts as a multi-trick combo, which means you can do that a couple of times and suddenly, boom shakalaka, you have your combo requirement filled. And plus, I gotta say, the actual level design in this game is really boring. It just feels like normal streets and environments and whatnot, with a few bits of skateboarding architecture sprinkled around here and there. But when you're making a skateboarding game, you kind of have to build the entire world around skateboarding so that there's always somewhere within six feet to do a trick. That's how you keep the flow going. I don't think there's much flow to this game at all. And the general design is kind of dull. I'm sure this would blow a kid's mind back in the day, but then again, we already covered backyard skateboarding, and that was a game made for the same audience and was way better. This is just kind of rough all over, and it gets very repetitive, with basically every level having a very similar list of tasks. If you play one level, you've pretty much played every level for that specific mode. And there are a few other modes, but one of them is just a timed challenge to get as many points as you can, one of them is training, and one of them is free skate. So these two modes are undisputedly the main ones, but I don't know, with all the flaws, I can't really say this is a worthy time in hindsight. It has a bit of charm, and it's definitely more functional than some of these games, if only because it's so easy, but it's not a game that I'll ever feel the urge to come back to at any point. I give it a 4 out of 10. ESPN X Game Skateboarding is the second skateboarding game on this list by Konami. I guess they really wanted to get that sweet, sweet skateboarding dollar, and since Tony Hawk was already tied down, they decided to sign the branding of the second most well-known name in skateboarding, and that is, of course, the X Games itself. Because aside from Tony Hawk or the X Games, you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody who could name anything skateboarding-related outside of those two things. Although these days, you might think of Darby Allen, but that's only if you're a wrestling fan. I would assume the X Games branding is being used solely to sell this game, considering that the actual pros that they signed on are a who's who of I have no idea who that is. With the exception of Rick McCrank, but that's really only because I've personally met him. X Games Skateboarding, as I'm gonna call it for expediency's sake, is a bit of a tragedy because when it started out, I actually thought it had potential to be really good, or at least decent. I'll explain why in a minute, but only after I discuss some of the flaws. The controls in this game feel somewhat unresponsive compared to how they should feel. In a good skateboarding game, you should be able to ollie and then press the flip trick in very quick succession after each other, and once you're in the air, the flip trick should happen, but in this case, you can't do a flip trick unless you hit the inputs once the animation of ollieing has already happened, but also not too long after the animation has already happened, otherwise you'll obviously bail meaning you have this really awkward window of opportunity to do a trick which messes with your timing. Furthermore, it's genuinely difficult to string combos together because they add unnecessary inputs to do somewhat basic things. For example, to manual, you press up, down, R1. You can't just hold R1 and press up, down. That would be too easy. You can only press R1 after you press up, down. Also, you seemingly can't ollie out of a manual, which makes it functionally useless as a mechanic because you can't use it to string anything together. So there's a real awkwardness to the controls that makes it somewhat difficult to play in a lot of instances. Even specifically, ollieing is a bit of a pain in the ass to use optimally because the specific timing of when you should press it when you're on a ramp to get maximum height is a bit unpredictable. With that said, however, this isn't necessarily a deal breaker because when I was playing through the actual X Games mode, I found that I quickly adapted to this game's controls. 
It's stiff and somewhat unresponsive, but when you're just focusing on getting points, it's not too bad, especially when you figure out that the best way to get points is to press the triggers to rotate, which will multiply the score of your trick. Which is incidentally the only means to rotate in this game, which I actually agree with, because it means that you don't have to worry about multiple rotation inputs, which might get in the way at times. But regardless, if you can build up your special meter and do your ultimate special trick while also rotating and stringing in a bit of extra combo, you can get like 50,000 points in a single go, which will essentially win you the competition immediately. And that goes for the half pipe and the general park tricks. Unfortunately, the actual X Games portion of this game is somewhat token, as you only get a single version of the competition for both the half pipe and the park. Whereas the actual bulk of the game is in the arcade mode, which plays very similarly to a Tony Hawk game. You go through some levels and have to accomplish tasks, and let me tell you, this is where the game takes a nosedive in quality. Because the ability to pull off some of the tasks that you need to pull off requires controls a hell of a lot more responsive and tight than the game provides. And it also requires the game actually doing what you want it to. Like destroying the fire hydrants. I ran into that thing like three times before it actually broke. What was the differentiating factor? I have no idea. Yeah, getting points is simple enough if you could find a decent half pipe and do the same thing you would do in the X Games mode, but doing the other tasks can almost be agonizingly difficult. The worst of it is when they expect you to string a combo of a certain amount of tricks together. The fact that being able to string together 6, 8, or 10 tricks is enough of a challenge that they made it a level necessary task is bad enough. But they definitely prove that, because while doing the other tasks in these levels tend to go by swiftly enough, trying to make the combos cooperate with you for long enough to do however many tricks is much more difficult than it should be. You can do it all through grinds, but trying to find a straightaway long enough to do six grinds is hard, especially considering you can't grind on the curbs like you can in any sane skateboarding game. But then if you try and mix flip tricks and grabs in, you'll have to worry about the awkward timing throwing you off. Plus, like I said, you can't use the manual to help you out. So we're stuck with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 levels of combo stringing, except with 80% worse controls. I also have an issue with the speed in this game, in that there's no gradual process of speeding up. You basically do one kick and are at full speed, and if you want to slow down and approach something more methodically, you have to be careful, otherwise it's very easy to slow down so much that you stop, then you have to start the whole process over again. I also have a problem with the soundtrack. Okay, not really. There are definitely some bangers here, although as a Linkin Park fan, why would you license a place for my head? That's gotta be my least favorite song by them, because it sounds like Chester is singing the song while choking back tears. And while I'm on the topic of hot Linkin Park takes, A Thousand Suns is a top three album, Meteora is infinitely better than Hybrid Theory, and One More Light is tragically overhated. But anyways, this game has so many little annoyances. It has the same issue that Disney Sports Skateboarding has, where pretty much every aspect of the game feels noticeably awkward, and because there are so few moving pieces, every flaw is felt all the more. Pretty much every aspect of the game feels in some way botched, if only slightly. The sad fact is, the awkward feeling game engine does work in some ways when you're only expected to do a certain amount of tricks. So all they need to do is tighten up the controls, fix the input timing, and expand on the actual X Games element of the game, and you would have something fairly solid here. But ultimately, I feel that ESPN X Games Skateboarding really misses the mark, but it doesn't miss the mark so hard that I wouldn't want them to try again, but I still beat the game. So there's that. I give it a 4 out of 10. But in the spirit of Konami trying out the skateboarding thing again, that brings us to... Evolution Skateboarding. What a shame this one is. It could have been great. It was another in-house production by Konami, whose other most famous sports title would be Pro Evolution Soccer. I bring this up because I think the evolution in Evolution Skateboarding might have been meant to cross the brand over. This being the second attempt at making a non-licensed skateboarding video game based off the Tony Hawk formula, one would imagine the X Games skateboarding game was the test run, and this is the legit go, as it should have been. They signed on even more pro skaters that weren't tied down to contracts with the Tony Hawk series, including Danny Way, who was my favorite skateboarder as a teenager and honestly continues to be. In my opinion, he's the greatest non-mainstream skater of all time. I also got this picture with him back when I was 14 or 15 or whatever. Man, I was so geeked when this happened. So all they needed to do was make a halfway decent game, and the Tony Hawk series could have a decent competitor. This was one of the first Tony Hawk ripoffs I played all the way back in the Halcyon days of 2014, and I remember bringing this game home excited to check out what was surely to be a hidden gem. 
Unfortunately, the best way I could describe this would be Tony Hawk's Pro Skater at home. It's better than the X Games skateboarding game. In fact, I would say it's a significant improvement, but it still suffers from a lot of the same issues that game does. You still have to wait until you're fully in the air to hit trick inputs in order for them to actually go through. The movement and interaction with the environments is still a bit inconsistent and awkward at times. It's still considered an accomplishment to string a few combos together, though it's not as tough because you can now manual out of half pipes in order to keep your combo going. You might have been able to do that in the previous iteration, but I never managed to pull it off. But one of the reasons I'm able to do that now is because instead of having to press up, down, or down, up, plus an extra input, you just need to press up or down once, plus a button input. Which is one way this game makes the engine much more user-friendly. I remember it being worse when I first played it all the way back in the day, but I guess I've learned to appreciate it more now that I've played a bunch of games that are actually worse than Evolution Skateboarding in every way. Plus, this is a game with a much smoother engine and a greater sense of creativity. The Tony Hawk games were always a bit absurd, but mostly still had one foot in reality. This game goes full tilt wacky with such things as a giant crab boss and a level on Big Shell from MGS2. I played MGS2 once. It's a game that completely lost me by the end because I was watching a 40 minute cutscene with so many plot twists I completely lost track of what the game was even about, but hey, it's still a cute little novelty. You can even play a Solid Snake or Raiden in this game if that's your cup of tea. Plus, it also has multiple other boss fights, including a giant tanker and a tank. You defeat them by grinding on various parts of the vehicle while also avoiding obstacles. It's about as complex a boss fight as you can get in a game like this, but it's still kinda cool. This is a very unique and creative skateboarding game. It's probably the most gamey skateboarding game I've ever played, but if I'm being honest, I'm struggling to find things to even say about this game because everything I could say about it, I already said about X Games skateboarding. This game even includes most of the same roster. But I'm sorry, Rick McCrank, you've been replaced. In no uncertain terms, this is a game that's better in every way than X Games skateboarding. It's not a patch on the best games in the genre, or even the best games on this list, but it's still a worthy time if you've run out of new Tony Hawk games to play. I give it a 6 out of 10. Yanya Kabbalista City Skater is a game where the name is somehow not the weirdest thing about it. Like, this might be another one of the most Japanese games I've ever played, along with Go Go Hypergrind. No disrespect, I just personally don't find a lot of the tropes generally associated with Japanese media my thing. That's why I never really got into anime. But if you're wondering what the weirdest thing about this game is, it's the default control setup. The way this game is set up, you have to use both analog sticks, fair, but they also expect you to play with the controller vertically. When I look at this control setup, it's one of those things that probably would have been a neat idea in a pitch meeting, but you quickly realize that this is a control system that basically appeals to nobody except maybe the lead designer. Because it's a lot cooler in theory than in practice. Like, genuinely, who asked for this? Like, who tested this game and approved the idea of designing it for the same three-armed people the N64 controller was designed for? I'm not opposed to a skateboarding game that uses both analog sticks to control movement, kinda like what Katamari Damacy does. Hell, that's basically what the Skate series does, and that series is great. And I'm definitely not against games not conforming to the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater control style, because as long as the gameplay is smooth and it controls intuitively, I can adapt just fine. For example, Thrasher Skate and Destroy controls extremely differently to the Tony Hawk games, but that game is great. Hard as hell, but it's great. Whereas the controls in this game are anything but intuitive, and trying to get your head wrapped around it? Well, it'll take way too long and will be way too frustrating, and trying to press the face buttons to do tricks while the controller is vertical is awkward as hell. Like, they substitute the L3 and R3 for X and Triangle, but that doesn't help. And honestly, that overshadows the entire game if you ask me. But mercy of all mercies, they do give you the option to turn it off, so once you're past that little hurdle, what is this game about? It's essentially Jet Set Radio by way of Tony Hawk. The aesthetic and physics are very Jet Set Radio, meanwhile the controls and gameplay are very Tony Hawk. Though to be fair, I don't remember the physics in Jet Set Radio being this floaty. I guess the idea is they're taking the arcade style and punching it up to 11. So you stay in the air for ages and maintain full control, but it's a bit of a double-edged sword because you literally bounce off the scenery. Like, literally bounce off. Like you're made of rubber. 
But the fact is, none of this would be a deal breaker on their own, and if these were as far as the flaws went, to be honest I think this would be a pretty solid game. And in fact, the whole concept of this game is actually a neat idea. Basically, there are these ghosts around each map called Gawus. Basically, skateboarding yokai. And you have to do a certain amount of tricks within a certain vicinity of them to banish them. Some of these Gawus will go down with a single trick, some of them will have a slightly longer health bar, so you have to do multiple tricks or a big trick to banish them, and some of them will also have specifically designated tricks that you need to do in order to banish them. Then if you banish all the Gawus in one area, you open up the next area. Eventually you fight a boss which has a super extra long health bar and means to defend itself. So you have to do a crap load of tricks while also following it around. So I'd say this is all relatively simple. Plus, the critical path only has five levels, so even if the concept wore out its welcome quickly, it's not a particularly large investment of time. Well, in theory, because it's all on a timer, and not a particularly forgiving timer. There's plenty of ways to get more time, and at first it's fairly forgiving, but it gets less forgiving as the difficulty ramps up. But that wouldn't be an issue if you were actually given the ability to do what you needed to do, because even once you're past the whole vertical controller thing and are playing this game like an actual game, it's still not a pleasant experience. Because in a lot of cases, the tricks just don't happen. Like, I'm not even sure if it's a timing thing or whatever, but sometimes I'm in the air and, like, tapping the flip trick button while moving the direction back and forth to try and get anything to happen, but nothing does. This might be one of the most unresponsive games I've ever played. There's no rhyme or reason why you're able to do tricks in certain cases and not able to do tricks in other cases. The game just flat out doesn't do what you want it to do, and whatever factor that was differentiating pulling something off and not pulling something off is ambiguous at best. I managed to get through this relatively well until I got to level 4. Even then, level 4 wasn't too bad until I had to banish a couple of Gawus with such massive health bars that they would take a multi-pronged combo to get rid of. And I was able to get a halfway decent combo going in some cases, but then in other cases, once again, the game just wouldn't do what I wanted it to do. I pressed the buttons, I mashed the buttons, I talked slowly to the buttons, and nothing worked. But then sometimes it would. Not being able to beat Simpson skateboarding because it had a non-self-explanatory mechanic and the game froze while I tried to learn that mechanic is one thing. Not being able to beat Yanya Cabalista City Skater all because the game is one of the most unresponsive games I've ever played, that's a whole nother thing. It's honestly, and I might get some shit for this, it's honestly less playable than Skateboard Madness Extreme Edition because Skateboard Madness Extreme Edition was broken as hell, but at least when you pressed the buttons, the game did the thing. The only reason I would say this is better is because it has an actual aesthetic, the unresponsiveness only becomes a problem as of level 4, and honestly, it's at least attempting to be a worthwhile game, it just fails. But it also does have potential, if it just fixed the control issues, it would be one of the better games on this list. In fact, I would love to see them give this concept another crack, because the concept alone is worthy of a second chance. But unfortunately, I can't grade this game based on potential, so I would say that this is a 3 out of 10. And now the final, and as yet, most recent game on the list, Skatebird. Releasing in only 2021, which means there's a very good chance that the developer might actually watch this and get offended. So I just want to reiterate what I've said in the past. When I call something a knockoff in this case, it's not necessarily supposed to be taken in a negative way. Only if the game is bad. I mean, really, this is a series where I'm highlighting games that are inspired by other games, and calling something a knockoff is a succinct and evocative way to bring that across. But that does mean it carries some unfortunate negative connotations that are unintended. Keep that in mind now more than ever. Skatebird was a relatively big indie game when it was released. It wasn't on the same level as Undertale or Disco Elysium, but I would say it was a tier below those, but it's more or less been forgotten about since. Which is a shame, because if you're trying to scratch that Tony Hawk-based itch, this might just do the trick. Speaking of Hawk, I wonder how much of this game's existence can be owed to that pun in the title, and the fact that Tony Hawk's name is Hawk. Now, first of all, this game is charming as hell. I mean, there's definitely an element of meme humor, and the game's dialogue is trying a bit too hard to be funny. I feel like that can be overdone or tiresome for some people, but I feel like the game has enough tongue-in-cheek with its sense of humor that it remains consistently charming. Especially the fact that all this overblown dialogue is being spoken by birds, with each bird having its own distinct personality. From the bird based off Sam Fisher, who demands snacks and blows things up, a pyromaniac bird, a grumpy old man bird, all the way to the main character who just wants what's best for his big friend. 
But seeing as some of these birds are references to real and fictional people, I would have popped so hard if one of these birds were named Toriyama. Go Toriyama, and teach a dinosaur to ride a ball. But you might be intrigued by that big friend thing I mentioned. You see, that's the funny part. Despite the cute presentation and all the funny little details, the actual plot of this game is too real. You see, the main character is the pet of an unseen person who they simply refer to as Big Friend, who all the birds love, and the entire plot is based around him basically being in a really rough state in his life, working a dead-end job he hates and that abuses its workers by forcing them to work unpaid overtime. This results in the Big Friend losing the spark in his eye, and so he's let his life fall into disrepair, showcased in the first level when we see the mess that is his apartment. So despite never being stated, this game deals with themes of depression and being trapped in a crappy situation. And I kind of wonder how much of this is built from the creator's experiences. Perhaps this game is a cute little interpretation of what happened to the writer when they worked a previous job they hated before they decided to pursue game development. But either way, this is something that I and I'm sure many people have felt all too well, and obviously if this is a reinterpretation of the developer slash writer's own experiences, then they've definitely put their own experiences through the filter of their own pet bird. The creators of this game definitely have pet birds, because there's a lot about this game that feels distinctly characterized by the quirkiness of pet birds, including a mode where you can pet the bird. And that's friggin adorable. And there's also the character customization where you can pick from various species of bird as well as various articles of clothing. So you can make your bird look like a distinguished little gentleman. I of course chose to have the bell for the hat because it's a reference to one of my favorite memes of all time, because I'm a sucker for silly animals. The extent of the character customization will probably explain why the graphics are a bit buggy. Things will clip into each other from the character models to the scenery quite a bit, but I still adore it. And I really appreciate all the little touches that this game had that wouldn't be there if it were humans instead of birds. Like how if you bail, you can flail around flapping your wings and yelling for as long as you want before resetting. Or if you press the grab button on flat ground, you'll do a manual style trick that's just called Monch. That's too precious. Normally I'm a bit dubious of things that try to go out of their way to be cute, that's why something like Super Lucky's Tale looks sickening to me. But I feel like this game has enough irony in its presentation and enough darkness to its themes that it works for me. Not fully, but mostly. The game as it sits is a linear sequence of levels that each have a main goal you work towards, which you pull off by doing long sequences of somewhat disconnected tasks. Sometimes you'll need to unlock the main missions represented by the orange marker by doing side missions represented by the blue marker. It's like a more focused version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 4, which seems to be a recurring theme. I found that it wasn't a particularly difficult game, but generally it's a game that's more about the overall experience than the actual difficulty, though the penultimate level is a bit stiff. But still, many of these tasks are familiar if you've played a Tony Hawk game recently. Collecting letters, collecting various things, doing trick sequences on specific parts of the level. Familiar, but not the least bit bad. There's an undeniable charm to Skatebird between the mimetic presentation and dialogue, the absurdity of the concept, and the general design and controls of the game. Like, I'll admit, I had a smile plastered on my face for quite a while while I was playing this game. Unfortunately, there is an undeniable amateurish jank. I think that might be an inherent thing with the Unity engine, but I found that this does not have the tightness of design or reliability to fully reach its potential. Like, for example, going up a half pipe or a quarter pipe. This is something that most games can do relatively easily, but it's even odds if you'll go up the half pipe and ramp off properly, or if you'll launch beyond the half pipe, and I don't know what the variable is. This is something I noticed very early on, and it ruins otherwise solid runs. It also doesn't help that this game has a point system that's both good and bad. The combo timer will continue between tricks. Your combo can be resumed even after landing for a short period of time, and that period of time will decrease the longer your combo is. It's actually a pretty smart system that is surprisingly forgiving. The problem being that if you bail, the points get reset no matter what. Even if you bail doing something completely unrelated to the tricks, so you can have a really massive combo then just step over a jagged piece of ground while you're waiting for the combo meter to empty and suddenly your combo is dead in the water. And I feel like, in a lot of cases, this combo engine incentivizes you to do a certain amount of tricks and then stop in your tracks until the combo ends naturally, which is kind of lame if you ask me. But the problem is, if you do have an in-between system when it comes to tricks, there's no easy way to fix it so that you don't lose points unfairly. 
about it. Like, you could theoretically have it to where if you land after a sequence of tricks and aren't currently trying to do any tricks, you get the amount of points that you currently have if you bail. But that would probably be a pain in the ass to program because there's so many variables. So unfortunately, this is a byproduct of the system that's pretty much impossible to separate, so I think I would have preferred it if they had a classic system of your points only counting based on the current string of uninterrupted tricks instead of having the ability to interrupt them. But then again, it's not exactly as easy to string combos together in this game compared to your average Tony Hawk game because of the aforementioned jankiness of the system and looseness of design. Plus, this game doesn't have an equivalent of the revert, which lets you continue doing tricks out of a half pipe. But then again, a lot of the critical path doesn't involve getting points. There's like one minigame per level where you have to get a certain amount of points, and it only gets difficult in the final stretch. And seeing as the physics are a bit floaty, you can actually do multiple flip tricks in one ollie. Especially because you can actually double ollie. Makes sense, you're a bird, you can just flap your wings. And in the odd occasion where you do have to get points, it's easy just to spam. A lot of the game's challenge exists outside of the tricks, so it's not that big of a deal. Still, there is a level of inconsistency with the engine that makes even tasks on the critical path inconsistent in their difficulty. Like collecting items in hard-to-reach spots, or having to do tricks on hard-to-reach places. I feel like this is a game that was close to being a really fantastic skateboarding game, but it does fall flat in some ways. It didn't have the budget or the manpower of your average AAA game, so there's some unavoidable shoddiness, but it's also a game that has a central vision that comes with being a passion project by an individual or a few individuals. And I feel like, despite lacking the polish of something like Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure, this is still the best game I've covered during this retrospective. What it lacks in polish, it more than makes up for with pure personality and charm. And its janky elements are far from deal breakers. Genuinely, while this may not be the greatest skateboarding game of all time, it absolutely makes up for its downfalls by being a very charming, very quirky game that's completely and utterly absurd. I give it an 8 out of 10. Well, alrighty then. Out of what might as well be the entirety of the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater knockoff genre, it's a shame that so few were actually above mediocre. But that's the price you pay when you're copying someone else's homework. Granted, some of these were distinctly doing their own things, and were definitely just doing skateboarding in their own way, but you don't know this until you try them, because when you have so many skateboarding games coming out so soon after Tony Hawk's Pro Skater made it big, everything is kinda guilty until proven innocent. Now, if I were to rank the games I've covered today, Skateboard Madness Extreme Edition comes in dead last, followed by Yanya Cabalista City Skater, followed by Disney Sports Skateboarding, then Simpsons Skateboarding, followed by Disney's Extremely Goofy Skateboarding and ESPN X Games Skateboarding after that, then MTV Sports Skateboarding featuring Andy McDonald, Evolution Skateboarding would come after that, then we have Backyard Skateboarding, then we have Go Go Hypergrind, then after that, we have Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure, which falls just short of Skatebird in first place because, well, Disney's Extreme Skate Adventure cheated, so, you know, can't let it get away with that. It's funny how the games that were most favorably received were the ones that managed to have decent controls and did their own thing. Skatebird, Backyard Skateboarding, and Go Go Hypergrind are the three that stood out to me the most. Games that are solid in their own right and are very memorable in their design and subject matter. But it's also funny how many Disney games were tied into this. What was it with Disney and skateboarding in the early 2000s? Well, like I said, I guess it was when they were trying to make their token efforts to update their classic characters to fit a modern audience, which I think is the definition of pissing into the wind. Characters will always appeal for certain reasons. Changing them to appeal to different audiences will leave nobody happy. But I'm not a Disney adult, so I guess I'm the last person to speak with authority on the appeal of classic Disney characters. But seriously, if you include ESPN X Games Skateboarding, which are both owned by Disney, four of the games today were in some way tied to Disney properties. And also three separate games were made by Konami, which really just tells you how desperate they were to try and get their fingers into the pie of skateboarding games. Well, tough luck. I'd like to see more people give their take on classic arcade-style skateboarding in the future, because while it may have been oversaturated at a time, it's a bit barren these days, and it would be fun to see it make a comeback. But that's all I've got. What's your favorite Tony Hawk-style game? Let me know in the comments, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification icon so you're always up to date on what I'm doing. And if you want to support me in a more direct fashion, you can pledge to my Patreon for unique perks and rewards such as early access, Discord benefits, and exclusive content along with these fine folks right here.
And an extra special thank you to Andrew Ritter, Brooklyn, Dick Kickham, Gaw004, My Name is Tank, Monsieur Tenadier, Patchwork, Raf, Ranger X, and Weird Webster for going above and beyond. Elsewise than that, I've been the King of Snark Style right here on Tactical Bacon Productions, and I will see you next time. Stay crispy, my friends.